Um, Ashwin, can we have you on the screen? Over to you, Mrs. Panakal. Good evening and a warm welcome to all our viewers on YouTube and Facebook to the fifth panel of our Mysuru Literature Festival fifth edition and our second virtual one. And of course, a warm welcome to our panelists, Mr. Ashwin Sanghi and Mrs. Anuja Chandramauli. Thank you both very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, and thank you, Mrs. Panakar, for that thank warm you. welcome. A brief about author Ashwin. He has made Mumbai as his home. He has done his master's from prestigious state university in United States of America. Ashwin is a well-known author in India as Dan Brown. He has the distinction of being included by Forbes India to its 100 celebrities list. This is Sangam Panakal. Can you mute? 100 celebrities list. This best-selling author has written novels like Krishna Ki, Chanakya's Chant, and Vault of Vishnu. Being a popular and an articulate speaker on many topics, Ashwin is a very well sought after speaker at several academic and literary events. He is the recipient of many awards and honors, including Vodafone Crossword Popular Choice Award. Private India, a book co-authored by him, made it to the UK top bestseller list. Thanks, Ashwin, for accepting our invitation to be with us here today. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Shobha. Thank you. Okay. Now, about our Anuja, the young author, who's going to moderate the session. As a country, we have an issue stepping out of our past shadow. She says this, and she's right in saying so because she has thoroughly explored writing books of genre of mythological fantasies and historical his and history fiction in the Indian context. Anuja's debut novel, Arjuna, the saga of a Pandava warrior prince, was named as one of the top five sellers in Indian writing category by Amazon India. She followed that novel by stories about many Indian mythological figures like Kamadeva, Yama, Kartikeya, Mohini, Ganga, Prithviraj Chauhan, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, and Shakti, the Divine Feminine. She regularly conducts creative writing workshops to students and an accomplished Bharatanatyam dancer she is. A warm welcome to you, Anuja. A warm welcome to all our viewers, trustees, book club members. Please like and subscribe for our channel. The screen is all yours, Anuja and Ashwin. Thank you so much, Shubha and uh, Mysore Lit, Lit Fest. Thanks so much for hosting Ashwin and me. It's uh, always a huge treat for me to be in conversation with Ashwin uh, because first and foremost, uh, I am a fangirl. Uh, I, I read his uh, Chanakya's chant quite some time ago. And I remember I got in touch with him on Twitter to very tentatively, I messaged him on uh, Twitter to tell him that I really, really, really love that book. And I think one of the highlights of my life was having Ashwin respond to my tweet. And I remember thinking he's such a warm, charming dude in addition to being brilliant. And uh, my, I, I don't know, my... Uh, Opinion of him just keeps getting better with time. And, uh, you know, over the years, we've been on panels together. And uh, I love talking to Ashwin. He's just too brilliant. And I've been binge reading Ashwin, by the way. Uh, oh, because, really? you know, we're in this session. And I've been just like on an Ashwin Sanghi binge. And it's brilliant. It's the best way to spend time, if you ask me. Love your books, Ashwin. So happy you agreed to You are to this. too sweet, Anuja. That's the reason I love doing panel sessions with you. You know, you can... You can, uh, 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 I know that we are going to, the topic of this session includes the word chini, but you are not chini, you are makhan. 
you are you are just delightful you are a mixture of chini and makkhan so thank you so much i'm delighted to be here and i'm delighted to be here in conversation with you all right i think we're off to a great start and uh, okay ashwin my first question for you and believe me i have some tricky ones for you mm -hmm. uh, so ashwin fans will know that uh, ashwin has the dexterity of a tightrope walker you know he takes diverse subjects like spirituality and science quantum physics and vedanta and somehow he kind of you know finds balance between these disparate fields of thought for instance uh, i think in today's india i think we have a little uh, difficulty trying to reconcile our spiritual side with our scientific side we are forced to pick sides right if you are hmm. uh, open about your spirituality they they call you a sanghi or a bhakt yeah right? in my case of course i am automatically classified as a sanghi because of my surname so irrespective of what view i hold in any case uh, you know uh, uh, the the regular refrain is ah okay fine you have a view which sort of reconciles with a little bit right right of center or to the right then it in any case it just explains the fact that your surname is sanghi and it's used as an insult unfortunately <laughs> absolutely like absolutely Absol so, but but you know I, i i wear it almost as a badge of honor uh, anuja because uh, to a very great extent uh, and I, i've said this before uh, honestly speaking to my mind one of the one of the great uh, the great things about our civilization uh, is the fact that we have always been able to accommodate a plurality of views and i don't know when it is that we really lost that ability uh and i know that there will there will be a bunch of people who will jump on this and will say oh you know well probably it started with the narendra modi era no that's nonsense what what i'm talking about is this entire post independence era uh where we almost in some ways abrogated the right for uh the guardians of history to be a certain set of people uh you know i mean if you really think about what we consider to be the word liberal uh, what what well, it comes from the latin word liberalis which means free so in that sense i would imagine that a liberal is supposed to be someone who is willing to accommodate any view and even though he or she may disagree with that view he would say that well you are entitled to your view and to your opinion uh and in that sense i consider myself to be a liberal at heart whether it is in terms of uh gender equality whether it's in terms of racial equality whether it's in terms of freedom of faith whether it's in terms of freedom of sexuality uh lgbtq rights you you name it i i i believe that i am a liberal but somewhere along the way i feel that liberals became illiberal uh and uh as a result of which uh somehow or the other you had to toe the line which was the so called accepted version uh a unidimensional view of truth as it were mm. uh and i have always maintained this that the best way of understanding historical narratives is through multidimensionality uh so because ultimately at the end of the day uh history is is never going to be unidimensional because it will vary according to the narrator uh their own biases will come into the narration their own belief system will come into the narration their own political objectives will come into the narration yeah. um i mean they it, 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 who was it who said that uh, uh uh you know history is yesterday's politics and politics is is today's history being made yeah. i mean so in that sense or uh, there are bound to be uh uh colors there are bound to be shades and the only way of being able to actually describe many of those events is by allowing those multiple voices to flourish uh so uh, uh in that sense i i look at it almost like putting on a pair of 3d glasses when you go in for a 3d movie uh yeah. and actually what you have is maybe about two or three projectors which are which are which are actually beaming at that point of time but your 3d glasses are able to give you a holistic three dimensional view of mm. each of those projections it's able to take each of those individual beams and put them together 
And that's what we really need to be able to achieve uh, in, in the story of narratives. So uh, I'm quite happy if you want to call me a liberal, you want to call me left wing, you want to call me right wing, you want to call me by my surname Sanghi, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, I just wish that all of us would allow multiple narratives to flourish. That's all. I think it's brilliant how you straddle, uh, you know, this uh, ideological minefield, actually. I think it's uh, really cool that um, you, uh, I mean, there's a strong spiritual side in your novels. And uh, it, I think it's an Ashwin Sanghi quote because you talk about how, uh, you know, uh, a true spiritualist needs to think scientifically and a scientist needs to have a spiritual side. So sure. I think it's easy. Easier said than done. And I think your books have a very nice balance. Uh, even something like um, uh, I talked about how you take quantum physics and Vedanta and somehow you draw these parallels, which seem incredible because not many of us would think of uh, Vedanta and uh, quantum physics in the same, uh, you know, in the same, I don't know, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, on, honestly speaking, uh, to a very great extent, I think uh if you really think about if you really think about it uh, for the longest time the world of in the world of physics uh, you basically thought of the entire world as as one giant machine you know uh, everything was rather newtonian uh, in the sense that uh, every action has an opposite and equal reaction yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. which was really the world of classical physics as it was uh, yeah. and then of course you had einstein coming along uh, who brought in the, the whole concept of relativity. But then one went even beyond that and one suddenly realized that at the quantum world, uh, physics uh, doesn't, you know, the, the classical law seemed to almost break down. And what I found most interesting, Anuja, is the fact that really, um, what is it that quantum theorists are now telling us? That everything seems to be a notion of interconnected possibilities almost. Every particle is... Uh, both, uh, you know, uh, a wave function as well as a particle. So, in other words, it could it could be anywhere at any time, and it could be also at several places simultaneously. It's almost fuzzy, almost hazy, and in some ways, it fits in so beautifully with what our sages said about the concept of Brahman. Uh, you know, I mean, how they described it was: it moves, it moves not; it is far, it is near; it is within this, it is outside this. Uh, so, in fact, to a very great extent, you can't blame a lot of the early researchers, like, for example, whether it was Heisenberg or Bohr, uh, who had been uh, very closely exposed to Vedic philosophy. Uh, so, in that sense, um, I think uh, there is a huge scope for overlap. Uh, and that is really where, uh, for me, the, you know, as, as you know, I've always talked about myself as the overlap guy. Uh, where it's it's not history or mythology that interests me, but the overlap between them. It is not a uh, philosophy that interests me or science that interests me, but the possible overlap between them. Uh, and that is where I'm increasingly finding that uh, a, a lot of the stuff which quantum theory is talking about is the very same stuff that our ancient seers were talking about. Uh, so... Uh, for, for me, honestly speaking, the the interesting bit is that, hey, listen, you know, I mean, um, uh, what uh, what the our seers were attempting to do was to understand that there is a reality. The map is not the terrain. Uh, so you may have a very good reading of the map, but that doesn't mean you understand yeah. the ground which that map depicts. And so they understood that the world is Maya. And that there was a reality, there was an underlying reality under that Maya. And okay. their aim was to dig into that reality. But what they did was basically by silencing their rational mind, they were actually enhancing their intuitive mind. Mm. Whereas the opposite of that happens in the world of science, where they are um. also attempting to dig into the reality. But in, in that sense, they would rather do it through observation and experimentation rather than intuitively. So actually, in some ways, they are moving towards the more objective and rational part of the mind. But there comes a time where quantum theorists are having to fall back on what is intuitive. 
And that is where mm -hmm. this most tantalizing, uh, tantalizing uh, opportunity existed for me to be able to create a novel. And that's why I ended up writing Keepers of the Kal Chakra, uh, because it, it, you know, I, I, I just felt that to a very great extent, what science is attempting to explain and what our seers were attempting to explain seems to be, uh, seems to have a huge overlap. Actually, when you mentioned Brahman, I was thinking of, uh, you know, uh, Ardhanari, you mentioned Newton, we're talking about two yes. equal and opposing forces. And Absolutely. in mythology, you have Shiva and Shakti, who are supposed to Purusha and Prakriti, who are supposed to be, you know, the uh, provoke, no, no, the scientific way of putting it would be the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object. And we worship them as Ardhanari. And we talk about uh, the chakras being activated because of the Kundalini energy. And, you know, we talk about achieve, achieving moksha when the Sahasra chakra is reached. So, you know, that's pretty much what... Absolutely. And, and if, if you then go back again into the word Brahman, then uh, what do the, how do the Upanishads explain Brahman? They say it's neti, 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 which means neither yeah. this, nor this, nor that. Uh, yeah. So it is what it is not. Uh, so in other words, you have this strange situation where you're explaining something on the basis of what it isn't. And that's what we do with Shiva. We say Shiva, that which it isn't. Uh, mm. in, so in that sense, Shiva and Shakti were this beautiful way of being able to explain uh, almost, almost matter and antimatter, yin and uh, yang. Mm. Those concepts have uh, been there in philosophy for centuries. It's just mm. that we've not given it necessarily an objective construct. So I think to a very great extent, to simply say that, oh, oh the Rig Veda, or for that matter, the Upanishads uh, were way ahead of their time scientifically, yeah. I think that would be nonsense. I mean, yeah. I think they were attempting to come to a great, they were not bothered about whether they could prove a theorem or not. They were yeah. they were digging for reality and they were wanting to dig, dig, that, dig for that experientially. Uh, they no. were not interested in necessarily being able to write volumes about it. Uh, and that is where I think we, we sometimes get it wrong and we risk, we have a huge risk. We, you know, in a certain sense, Anuja, there is a responsibility on our generation okay. because uh, we have this possibility that we can have a situation where there is one group of people who say, no, nothing relevant came out of ancient India. Mm. Uh, that uh, at the end of the day, it, I, I really don't care. All the greatest achievements have happened from Europe and late in the post World War II scenario from the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the stuff which is mentioned in the in the Vedas and the Upanishads is stuff which mm -hmm. we can simply just read it in order to enjoy. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, there was nothing worthwhile that came from there. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have another school of thought, which is that everything worthwhile can be connected back to ancient yeah. India. Uh, whether it is aeroplanes and whether it is plastic surgery and whether it is now where where what worries me is that we risk throwing the baby out with the bath out with the bath water uh, so we, we need to find a way to balance this and say yes there are things that we should be proud of we can mm -hmm. be proud of the zero we can be proud of shunyata we can be proud of plastic surgery or cataract surgery. We can be yeah. proud of many, many things, but we don't need to be proud of everything that is not mm -hmm. connected to us. Mm -hmm. And I think that sense of balance is what is now needed because uh, this has become an ideological divide mm -hmm. uh, where there is, there is one party which says, hey, listen, nothing relevant came out of India. And the other section which says everything relevant has mm -hmm. a link to India ideological extremism in a manner of Absolutely. speaking and uh, okay so uh, more on this subject uh, you know I, a recurring theme in all your books uh, would be alchemy and immortality a quest for you know somehow uh, finding that elusive el elixir that can change matter into gold and uh, you know find eternal youth simple thing and uh, I love that in one of your books uh, I think it was the sale court uh, saga where you know you talk about how uh, the logical next step after you figured out how to change matter into gold uh, there's the key to immortality right there but you're so 
so blinded by your greed for gold, which as you know, is a bottomless pit that we keep rushing after gold. So my question for you is, why are we so obsessed with gold and immortality? It might seem like a stupid question, but we all know that, you know, uh, after the boom, there's going to be a bust. We are all rational people. We know that. And we know that, you know, no matter how much gold you get, it's never going to be enough. And who the hell wants to live forever? <laughs> After yeah, the pandemic, I think that's a question. I mean, it's, isn't it a curse? I mean, with Ashwatthama, one of the Chiranjeevis, it is a curse. Of course for it him is. To, yeah, Absolutely. so why do we chase after things that aren't good for us? Whether it's gold or whether it's immortality or chocolate or deep fried food. Why do we chase after? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you added on those two nouns in that in the end of that sentence. In, and since you are interviewing Ashwin, it could also add the word whiskey probably. But, but, <laughs> but the, the, the point is, I think, uh, you know, first remember one thing that in, in, in my case, I'm uh, very clearly in the commercial fiction space. So... Uh, uh, at the end of the day, while I do try and bring in philosophical and scientific and mythological and historical elements into my writing, but at the end of the day, the overall the overall framework is very much of a potboiler thriller. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the payoff will always be very very much in the in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I think, this notion of immortality is something which uh, I see as a recurring theme, not only in our uh, uh, Indian uh, philosophy, but we we I mean, since we are we are talking about uh, the uh, you know uh, Walter Vishnu, uh, the, you know, for example, when I visited uh, the uh, terracotta army. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, in Shenzhen province. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, uh, visit uh, China, but, um, uh, you know, you have these 8,500 life-size clay figures of soldiers and chariots and horses um, that were buried along with the very first emperor of unified China, uh, Kinshi Wang. Uh, that was more than maybe two millennia ago, probably around 250 BC. And it was, it remained completely hidden uh, until the time it was accidentally discovered in 1974. Now, of course, the Terracotta Army is a huge tourist attraction. Uh, and anyone visiting China, one of the places that they will definitely be on their tourist circuit uh, is the Terracotta Army. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, when you go back into the sort of background of what caused this, uh, you know, and it's it's stunning in detail because each and every figure uh, is so completely unique. It's not like a cookie cutter where every figure has been created exactly the same way. Each figure is unique in its own way. And it seems apparently that Emperor uh, uh, Quinchi Wang had been obsessed with the idea of living for, forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And he had already managed to conquer all the warring states in China and was probably the most powerful emperor that the land had ever seen. But he always wondered that could he also be immortal? And uh, his quest was for an elixir that would give him uh, eternal life. And uh, he began consuming cinnabar, uh, which is, you know, mercury sulfide, uh, in the belief that that would make him immortal. And instead... But he died causing... prematurely. Yeah, yeah, he died at age, I think around 38, 39, something yeah. like that. And of course, the the, the reason for creating the terracotta army was the fact that he thought that in that at least the terracotta army would be a way for him to be able to go into the beyond uh, along with, you know, the pretty much the way the Egyptians thought uh, mm -hmm. of the people that they put into the pyramids. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, whether it is, uh, whether it's our, uh, uh, our fascination with the Chiranjeevis in India, or whether it's the uh, the the uh, uh, you know Chinese fascination with immortality, uh, or for that matter, whether it is uh, in terms of uh, Middle Europe, uh, mm -hmm. their fascination with alchemy and the possibility of being able to turn baser metals into gold, uh, and therefore also be able to uh, turn 
a limited life into an unlimited one. Unlimited. Uh, I think that has been a, a normal human fascination. But you know what? Every story, as I, as you rightly pointed out, the Ashwatthama story, or for that matter, the Chinese story of the ter Terracotta yeah. Army, what it tells you is that that fascination has eventually landed up uh, mm. in 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 a in a ter terrible tragedy. Epic tragedy. In an epic tragedy. Uh, and in, in that sense, I think uh, what the process of alchemy is telling us is really that what you want is to be able to uh, attain higher levels of understanding, of spirituality, mm. of awareness, of consciousness. How can you, how can you turn your baser life, if you can, if you can work on lead, uh, and eventually turn that into gold, can you also elevate your own uh, sense of con consciousness uh, and your entire life, rather than uh, looking at it in the context of immortality? And uh -huh. frankly, uh, if, if you have even the slightest awareness of dharmic philosophy, then in any case, we know that we are all immortal. So, I mean, if I really think about it in the context of keepers of the Kal Chakra, what I said was that in case you can uh, consider a particle to not only be a particle, but also a wave function, mm. which means in other words, that uh, based on the act of observation, suddenly the wave function collapse, collapses mm. and you, it becomes a particle. It becomes material mm. because, of the, because of the very act of observation. Mm. Uh, uh, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, mm. you know, the very act of observation changes the nature of that wave function. Then in that case, why can't we think of our lives uh, in that similar fashion? That mm. maybe my soul is a wave function mm. and maybe the mere consciousness, the torch beam of my present lifetime collapses that wave function into the material nature of my life. And the moment that that consciousness is withdrawn, I go back into a wave function. So if I am a wave function, then in any case, I'm eternal. Lovely. And uh, no, this was, uh, while re while I was on my Ashwin Sanghi binge, this was something I thought I'll ask you. So uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as a writer, as an author, uh, which scenes are the most challenging to write? Is it the action, which you're brilliant at? You know, it's like edge of your seat action, which you've just nailed. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, the intense spirituality in your books, which you've somehow found a way to, you know, lots of people would find uh, the Upanishads extremely dry. But with you, it's like pacey. It's a pot boiler. And then you have this brilliant sense of humor. There's a lot of humor in your books. And of course, this, there are passionate scenes, sex scenes. So which is the hardest thing <laughs> to write? Uh, uh, you know, Anuja, for, for me, I think that the challenge is in taking some of the denser concepts mm. and bringing them into the format of a commercial thriller. So for, uh, so for example, uh, uh, in, uh, in our philosophy, you have the concept of shunyata, nothingness, yeah. that yeah. how can you, uh, how can you enter a state of nothingness and what is the why should you come? Why should you be aiming for nothingness? Mm. Now, how do I explain that to someone who doesn't have that same spiritual or philosophical construct available? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, in, uh, in one of my books, I talk about the fact that you're using an iPad with the screen on. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, but when, when you are watching a movie on your iPad with the screen on, with the brightness on, mm. you, can't, you can't discern the fingerprints on your mm. iPad. Okay. But now when you turn off the iPad and the screen goes dark, now you can see all the smudges on that screen. Mm. So in other words, to be able to discern the reality, you need to first switch off. Mm -hmm. In other words, that nothingness. Now, I know a lot of people will cringe at these okay. sort of metaphors, um. but there is no other way for me to be able to get across that view to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. uh, or, for example, the idea that your thought, a thought sent out into the universe, can actually have implications in terms of the changes that it makes. Mm -hmm. 
so in mm. other words it's not only what you do but even what you think and that even what you think is actually a form of energy and if einstein is to be believed then energy and matter are interchangeable e is equal to mc squared so my thoughts can actually produce uh, actionable changes now how do i explain that so i i say okay think about this that you're searching for something on google and mm-hmm. when you're searching uh, google sends gives you an auto populated box uh, that okay you've entered the first four letters and the auto populated yeah, box starts yeah, showing yeah. up but now it's not just that google is giving you info but the very nature of your query is also playing a role in terms of altering google's algorithm mm. uh, so in other words your thought is not only affecting you but it's also affecting the universe so for, for me the the biggest challenge whenever i'm talking about slightly more difficult concepts is how to make them visual so that they can be easily understood uh oh. the the action scenes are difficult to write but they are not insurmountable in that sense because mm-hmm. all you need to do is have a lot of patience in terms of figuring out how do, is this is this scene feeling completely visual or not mm-hmm. uh so and i i think the 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 golden rule is sh- show not tell in terms mm-hmm. of action sequences mm-hmm. so if you can simply th- you know if if there is a battle between two warriors if you can actually explain the bat- battle from what one of the warriors is feeling then the battle becomes that much more that much more visual to the reader um uh, but but i think the 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 bigger challenge uh, for most of the sort of stuff that i write and you must have faced it also because you dabble in the same set of uh, the, yeah. the same space uh when you do two years worth of research in order to write a book you have so mm-hmm. much material that you want to talk about mm 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 and the biggest challenge is not in terms of what you bring in but what you leave out uh because uh, to a very great extent uh, you know you you've you've spent a lot of time trying to figure out that material mm. and you would love to bring it out there to say hey you know you know what i know this also and i know that also but very often there is a intrinsic conflict between research and story uh mm. and uh you know so you need to bring in only that much research which really moves the story forward mm. and heightens the suspense and mystery uh without affecting the flow of the story or the pace of the story and i think that is the second biggest challenge that how do you make oh. sure that you don't compromise uh, and you mm. keep it evenly balanced and it doesn't work every time like for example i genuinely believe books like the rosabal line or books like mm-hmm. keepers of the kal chakra they are actually okay. meant for my most yeah. patient readers because they they just have so much of material in them that unless oh. you are someone who's really looking for the payoff at the end it's very easy to actually give up uh, but on the other hand books like let's say chankya's chant or the sial court saga or the krishna ki fundamentally they have far more of a pacey uh, you know storytelling fashion uh, so in in that sense i'm there are times when i consciously decide that no i mean this is a book which i'm which i'm writing for me uh because this is stuff that i want to explore and there are books in the bharat series which i write for my readers okay but uh, can i tell you you know uh, every time i read your books uh, i i love all the information that you share you know uh, after your research and honestly i feel so much smarter i think reading ashwin sanghi's articles and books make me sound so much smarter because it's like you know you have such a wonderful ability to grasp complicated concepts and to share it in a way which is very simple for some of us who are dummies when it comes to uh, finance and uh, banking and stuff like that so after i read you and i'm running around talking about you know intellectual stuff i always feel like yeah i'm smart now thanks to ashwin Anuja, so my uh, you, <laughs> you don't need to read ashwin sanghi to be smart you you are you are bloody smart there there have been times where we have been on panel discussions together and you have grilled the life out of me uh, or i've been stumped for answers so so please let, let's not do this i i know exactly where you're coming from and you are extremely smart 
no but uh, see th that's very sweet of you to say but but i genuinely feel i, I always tell a lot of uh, my friends you really should uh, read ashwin to get a better understanding of current current affairs and just about any field under the sun it's not just quantum physics and vedanta you learn so much from your books and my question to you is how come uh, you know when um, how come people like you aren't running this country because i feel for some reason in india you know people who hold a particular post they're singularly unqualified for the job so i'm always wondering why does an ashwin help run this country so is that something you'll consider in future you know maybe uh, stand for political office maybe pm ashwin sanghi some day well you know i mean the, uh, the i i don't know i i think the the problem is that uh, uh, to a very great extent the world of politics i mean you know there there is the old joke you know that w where does the word politics come from come from and it comes from actually two separate words poly and tix poly is many in latin right. and tix is of course blood sucking creatures so that's the nature of what we have in the world of politics so uh to a very great extent i think for a lot of people like me uh we you know there 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 are i i think we are we are supremely uh, good in terms of being able to offer advice and offer opinions uh, through our observations through through our speeches through our talks through our columns but at the end of the day uh, we lack the grit and the determination to be able to actually reach to a position where we can actually make a difference mm. uh, and i think uh th that is is one of those areas where i i believe that um uh, in the long run i think it will be in the interest of the political class uh, of our country to be able to create a space for those who might have something valuable to offer in terms of input uh because currently uh, what happens is that it might is right in some ways mm -hmm. um and i i think that there is a there is a lot of value add that people who may not be politically astute can offer that is not mm -hmm. to say that i believe that the uh, that successive governments over the last 70 years have got it wrong there are many many things in our country that we've got right mm -hmm. but sometimes i wonder why we are not applying simpler solutions to a lot of our problems i mean take for example let's say uh, something like uh, the justice delivery system of our country i mean uh, i uh, am one of those who believes that there is no reason for a judge to retire at age 62 uh, mm. because they've got at least another 10 years of productive life left in them so if you can't appoint fresh judges all you need to do is give an extension to the best of them yeah. uh for another 10 odd years use the same infrastructure of the high courts the lower courts and the supreme court uh and uh they wrap up at 5:30 uh give them an extra 4 hours worth of working like yeah. a evening shift from 5:30 to 9:30 uh you could clear off at least about probably one third of the backlog in about 5 years uh in terms of just, just justice delivery and it will not require any fresh investment it does not require any great out of the box thinking um or for example if you simply decided that hey listen you know all the tribunals that are created in this country will uh, uh, have to be the last will have to be the very last point of hearing when it comes down to the government as a litigant uh so i as an individual can still go to the higher court but the government cannot oh. uh that would simply eliminate 25 to 30% of the cases that are pending mm. uh now this is very simplistic stuff but no one wants apparently simplistic solutions um to, to my mind i take for example police reform it's it's something mm. which is which is so it's a crying need anuja police mm. reform is a crying need okay you can't do it everywhere because uh, law and order is a state subject but you today have a very large number of states which are ruled by the same party that rules the center mm. so just hold a competition between them for a model law and order state mm. so that in the next 5 years 
one state uh, will be held up as a shining example uh, of reformation in the police force. And then once you have learnings from that, you can easily replicate them as best practices across multiple states. So that's a simple way of looking at uh, uh, of looking at uh, you know uh, the uh, the law and order situation, uh, and to my mind, one of the one of the great uh, tragedies of our parliamentary and our ministerial uh, system is the fact that ministers come in and they simply run departments, so they become mm. semi bureaucratic in the sense that they are simply supposed to be clearing files and attending events and following their diary appointments. On the other hand, in case, let's say, you had a situation where a cabinet is brought in for a five-year period and every minister uh, is told that, hey, listen, you have to identify your three objectives that you will deliver on in the next five years, three key projects. What we call in management jargon, uh, key action areas. Uh, or key result areas. Hmm. Uh, imagine if you had if you had fifty or sixty people working towards three objectives, uh, you could get a couple of hundred very important things done in a five-year tenure. Uh, so I think simplification is something that we desperately need, uh, Anuja, hmm. and that hmm. is where I think probably maybe people like me are misfits uh, in terms of in you know because everyone wants quote unquote, sexy solutions, you know, sure. complicated solutions. Uh, I, and uh, I, I, I guess people like me are just not, not, uh, we are not cut out for that. Oh, uh, but you know what, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, Ashwin Sanghi has to be mandatory reading in my opinion, because I think you have a gift for taking these uh, unbelievably complicated things which have been unnecessarily complicated like you pointed out and you break it down and the solutions are so simple they're staring in your face and yet I think in your books also we see how you know repeatedly we make the process ridiculous and complicated for ourselves and um, uh, I think you know we've um, you talked about how there are some things we should retain from our great uh, past and leave out take the better, leave out the bitter, basically. Uh, I think uh, some of your books talk about the things we've lost, the knowledge that has been gained uh, from the ancients, you know, the wisdoms, uh, the wisdom which we painstakingly gathered, and so much of it has been lost in whichever field you can pick. And, uh, you know, I've always felt it could be because we've been so uh, reluctant to share knowledge. We hoard it. Of course, sometimes it is necess it's necessary because some information is very sensitive and uh, you do need to play close to the chest. But I think we've lost out on so much because, uh, because uh, you know, because of the secrecy involved and carelessness, I guess. So uh, I think uh, to a very great extent, Anuja, I think somewhere along the way, there is also a... Uh, a distinction between, um, you know, I mean, when people ask me what is what is fundamentalism, uh, to my mind, fundamentalism you can look at it even out of the context of religion. Fundamentalism is nothing else but an attempt to impose a singular truth on a plural world. Oh. Uh, and in that sense, I believe that our country has been. Uh, you know, if you really think about it, for the last, uh, for the last, I would say probably since the since the uh, advent of the Abrahamic faiths, mm. there has always been this so-called clash between Abrahamic and Dharmic uh, thought. Mm. Uh, and if you really think about it, Dharmic thought at at heart is essentially plural uh, mm. because it embraces multiple truths. Uh, mm. You know, you can have. Uh, 33 million deities, which are part of the fam same family. Uh, I mean, famously, you can see uh, Jesus Christ depicted on the facade of a Hindu temple, or yeah. uh, the Buddha can be simply absorbed as an avatar of Vishnu. Yeah. Uh, you could uh, decide to be Astic or Nastic, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you can be Shaivite, Vaishnavite. Uh, there are multiple people who are either vegetarians or carnivores or beef eaters or non beef eaters fire worshippers, idol worshippers, nature worshippers, you know, some people will worship Shiva, Shakti, combination of both. 
um, there are those who will uh, look at the path to enlightenment as a path of yantra or tantra or mantra mm. or none of the above. Uh, Anuja may say that, uh, you know, that stone is a shivling and Ashwin may say that that shivling is a stone. Uh, but both of us are welcome in that scenario. Mm. You know, we can have 300 versions of an epic uh, called the Ramayana, but uh, your version will not negate mine. Uh, and so in that sense, all belief systems are seen as paths to the divine. And this is really where, to my mind, I think we need to go back to that. Uh, that that is something which uh, which which we desperately need to bring back because that's this beautiful amalgamation of so many thought processes uh, and uh, we uh, even though we uh, we face the challenge uh, we face the challenge for a long time from the onslaught of Abrahamic uh, but our challenge is how do we absorb Abrahamic into our into our system. So mm -hmm. that it can be part of a pluris, pluralistic mm -hmm. view, even though intrinsically they can be, they can be that oh, there is one mm -hmm. truth and every other truth is irrelevant. And if you Heresy. don't believe it, you know. So, so how do we bring about that situation where there can be this beautiful mishran uh, mm -hmm. uh, of sorts? Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think. Um, uh, uh, this is not only related to religion, but it is also related to the thought process. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, just get onto Twitter for a couple of hours, and everyone has their perfect singular truth. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. My truth is the end all and be all. I know it all. Uh, I have the answer, and my answer is the right answer. And because my answer is the right answer, your answer is wrong. Uh, that is is where I think, uh, and we. This is not only specific to India. I mean, you you see this this clash yeah. all around the world in in every democracy, except for probably countries which are closed, uh, closed. Uh, you know where where uh, you can't express a view, but if you can express a view, if it's an open society, then you see this clash, uh, and it is mm. it is now become extremely polarized. Uh, what we have mm. lost somewhere along the way, uh, Anuja, is nuance. Um, the ability yeah, no, to no. be able to say that, listen, just because I, I mean, today, because I may be a, an advocate of a very strong state and very strong uh, national defense doesn't imply that that necessarily makes me into what you would categorize as a bhakt and puts me yeah. into a box. Because mm. I may have radically different views when it comes to, let's say, gender equality, uh, mm. uh, which would put me very firmly into the liberal camp. So mm. so th th this, you know, I mean, uh, who, who was it who said that, uh, you know, on the right, uh, nothing is right, and on the left, nothing is left. Uh, uh, so, you, you, you know, I mean, you, you look at the, the, the variety of experiences uh, on social media and you realize that uh, uh, what we have lost is the ability, partly it's also the world of 240 characters where you need to necessarily express everything in these short tweets uh, mm. uh, or a thread of tweets, as it were. Uh, and not everything can be expressed like that. Uh, certain things require a certain amount of nuance. And probably that's the reason why I'm a novelist rather than a short story writer or an essayist, because I need those 120,000 words to be able to develop my story and to develop my logic and to be able to give you the background of those characters and be able to flesh them out. Uh, so I, I, I think that is really what is lacking today. Uh, and probably if we could just learn to to, to listen to one another without agreeing to it. Uh, we, we don't have to agree, but we can, we can have civilized discussion. Mm -hmm. That is very, very important. We have to somehow bring about uh, that scenario. You see right now, for example, my dear friend Vikram Sampat's book, Savarkar, has, has just become this, this hot potato, as it were, where, uh, where he's being attacked from all sides. 
uh, uh, you know, about uh, about uh, his version of history. And the the way I look at it is that fine if you if you believe that there is something uh, materially wrong with what he has said, then certainly debate with him. But it's very easy to take pot shots in this two hundred and forty character world. Uh, in which mm. case, then all the person is doing is simply defending himself. So when will he do research on his next book? If that is what he is going to be spending his life doing, I don't think it's a it's an easy time to be someone who takes the middle path endorsed by Buddha and anyone who's inclined to be reasonable. I think uh, I do a lot of fence sitting, and I've, uh, I people accuse you of being a traitor if you. Refuse to choose a side, and if you say all sides, uh, for me personally, I think everyone makes sense from a certain angle, and I refuse. I'm, I think I'm extremist about that. That I that I think uh, I, that I refuse to, you know, just cast my lot with just this group or the, this group because I think everyone makes sense from a certain angle, and they do not make sense from a certain angle. Uh, and we were talking about Twitter where nuance is dead, where civilized debate is. Uh, I don't know, just impossible at this point. You mentioned uh, Vikram, and I think. Uh, 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 you know, I, uh, there was this thing which Kohli had put up about meaningful ways to uh, celebrate Diwali, and I liked your response to that, by the way, where you asked <laughs> me to. <laughs> no, I, you know, Anuja, I am one of those people who never, I, I don't like to be uh, quote unquote a troll, uh, and this was one of those few rare inst instances where I behaved like a troll. And later on, once I put out that tweet, I actually felt bad about having done that, uh, but. Uh, honestly speaking, to a very great extent, I do believe that there has to be balance in the world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you're continuously going to be preaching to one set of people, uh, then I, I am going to ask the question that where is your advice when it comes to a lot of other sections uh, uh, in, uh, in our country? So why is, why is this so-called well-meaning advice only for one particular section of people? Uh, and that was the context in which I, uh, in which I tweeted that. But I did not delete the tweet. But I did feel bad about having tweeted it later. No, I'm glad you didn't delete it. And I, and for the record, I don't think you were being a troll. As usual, it was very civilized, and you know your rapier sharp wit came to the fore. And I don't think you should apologize for it. And I'm glad you didn't. Delete that tweet because I loved it. I liked it. I retweeted it and did my share to contribute to the, <laughs> uh, you know, to the in, in immediate reaction on Twitter. So yeah, and there was this other thing uh, I wanted to bring up with you. You know, uh, you I think uh, you endorse uh, a more uh, embracing a more um, vegan like sure lifestyle. And see, for some of us carnivores, that's a little hard to take. So I wanted to discuss that with you. I wanted to ask you whether you genuinely think it's it would be viable if all of us ate the same thing. You know, I mean, no, not at I, all. I mean, maybe not we just all. trip I, the. I I am one of those who will have planet of cows and chickens or something. I mean, is it, do you really think it's viable? Why can't we just all learn, you know eat what we like and in moderation? We, we in must. Moderation. We we must and and. That's the reason why I'm not one of those who is ever for uh, setting down norms that, you know, uh, don't drink this or don't eat this, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's so ridiculous. But I think one of the things that I, I do feel is that to a great extent, we, uh, we have got almost blinkers on uh, when, when it comes to some of the bigger issues of our uh, world. Like, for example, I mean, uh, I don't know if you noticed this story a couple of months ago, which was on the so-called intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, which said that the world is likely to overshoot the threshold of one and a half degrees of warming over the next couple of decades. And of course, this will probably result in rising sea levels, forest fires, and what have you, you know, the usual stuff. But uh, when you talk to climate experts, they will all, uh, you'll hear the usual suggestions about using public transport or switching to electric vehicles and recycling waste. But uh, you'll very rarely hear climate change experts talking about the fact that billions of cows and goats, which are crowded into industrial farms, they produce enormous amounts of methane. And every gram of methane is 84 more times potent 
as a gram of carbon dioxide. So uh, in fact, uh, I mean, the US Environmental Protection Agency says that animal agriculture is actually the single largest source of methane emissions uh, in the US. I'm, I'm assuming that that applies to the rest of the world also. So if we truly are talking about fighting climate change, then eventually humankind will have to transition to a more vegan way of life. I have no problem in terms of what people want to eat, but then don't be hypocrites about the fact. It's like almost saying that I, I love animals and I'm so worried about cruelty to animals, but at the end of the day, uh, you, you are oblivious to what happens on Bakri Eid. So where I'm coming from is that a certain amount of semblance of balance in terms of, in terms of what we are saying, that I, I have no problem if you say I don't give a damn, I don't give two hoots about climate change and I want to eat whatever I want and I'll deal with the consequences. But this, this double-faced sort of nature of arguments that we put up, uh, I find it uh, impossible to reconcile. Or for example, uh, talking about, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the human rights situation in Kashmir, uh, without looking at what is happening with uh, human rights in Xinjiang uh, or the Muslim Uyghurs, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I find that mm -hmm. hypocritical. So this is where, to a very great extent, my arguments are that, hey, listen, let's bring about some amount of balance in terms of our arguments. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, uh, uh, take, for example, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the question of, let's say, for example, uh, economic disparities. Today, uh, we, we've got this great economic engine, uh, which is called China. And, uh, but that e economic engine has implied that they can detain a million Muslim Uyghurs in what they are calling now re-education camps. Mm. Um, and it can push through massive projects like the BRI. Uh, it can saddle developing nations with crippling debt. Uh, and just because of that economic might, uh, the world is not willing to talk about what is going on in Xinjiang. I find that extremely hypocritical. And so it's not as if I'm telling you, Anuja, that you need to do you need to eat in a certain way or drink in a certain way. But if you say that in the same breath as being focused on what happens with the overall climate, then I'll say, hey, listen, you know, I mean, I, I, I think we really need to re-examine the, the, the balance of arguments. Oh, see, uh, I'll have to, dis I agree with most of what you said as usual, but I also disagree. And I think we can agree to disagree, especially with the vegetarianism thing, because I think it is. I see, no, for in instance, fact, I'm a, me, the veganism, in fact, affects me also, because even though I'm fundamentally a vegetarian, even though I'm fundamentally a vegetarian, but uh, I do enjoy my occasional detours into the world of carnivores. Uh, and number two is yeah. the fact that I, I, can, uh, I consume dairy, which means, in other words, that I'm also a contributor uh, to the greenhouse gases that are generated as a result of the dairy farms. So in that sense, when I'm saying that the world will have no alternative but to move towards a more vegan lifestyle from the angle of climate change, I include myself as part of the problem. Oh, I agree that I'm also part of the problem. But the thing is, I, I see, for instance, uh, I'm a pet mama. I have two rotty babies. And uh, Anand always asks me, uh, Anand Neelakantan, a, a mutual friend, he'll always say, will you eat your dogs since yeah. you, you say you're a carnivore? And I say, uh, I say, dude, if you, uh, I mean, plants are living things too. So what's your problem with <laughs> vegetables then, you know? So, uh, and he gets Absolutely. so worked when I do that. So, but that's the thing, right? I, if you're going to talk about being caring to animals, why not? I, I care for all life forms. And then you'll have to live on love and fresh air like the sages of yore and, you know, so, just content yourself with a dew drop every so the, few millennia. Probably the, uh, the <laughs> answer, as in most things, Anuja, probably lies somewhere in between. Yeah. Uh, and and the, 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 meat consumption. Yeah, it, that is over a period of... I mean, the other day, for example, we were... My wife and I, about a year ago, year and a half ago, we were in we were in Hong Kong, and she ordered her a burger for herself, uh, which was uh, a burger which was I'm forgetting the brand name, but it was basically a meatless burger, but it oh. tasted like perfect beef burger. Uh, so 
the point i'm making is that technologies will happen changes will happen that doesn't mean that you won't be able to indulge but probably it will require the world to come together in order if it's like for example the carbon credit system which came about right. that okay there certain industries by their very nature are going to be polluting so whether we like it or not we will have to let these industries run but at the same time we can allow these industries to require to buy carbon credits so that somewhere else something worthwhile is happening in order to balance out the situation i am a marwadi the first thing i learned was debit and credit and that debit on one side of the balance sheet has to equal credit on the other side of the balance sheet fundamentally that's the karmic law i mean ultimately when you when you go up and meet your maker uh, you eventually do an analysis of your own balance sheet and the life the balance sheet of your own life probably like everything else uh, this is is simply about balance it's not about cutting out something today if you ask me if you tell me hey listen ashwin you know uh, gandhi ji said that the worst evil is to drink uh, and uh, i'd say listen you know i mean without my few pegs of whiskey in the evening my brain is not lubricated i can't do it so i'm the last person who will try and prescribe something i i genuinely believe that if there is one thing that we should prescribe is not to prescribe so to each his own no one yeah. says it better than ashwin so ye yeah, ashwin and uh, yeah i'll ask you a quick uh, question before i uh, you know move on to questions from the audience so uh, this one again is something uh, i think i personally wrestle with so i wanted to talk to you uh, you talked about how you uh, do this intense research for your novels and you travel and it's a very very immersive experience right sure. you live with these characters and you disappear into this world and uh, they become such an integral part of your life they are more real than most of the real people so called real, real people in your life so at times have you like wondered um, that as authors we kind of disappear into the fantasy worlds we create and we are extremely reluctant to come back to reality or you know whatever goes for reality these days and uh, you know you function on autopilot and you know it's sort of like disappearing into a another world so how do you kind of stay grounded how do you find that balance which is probably the true god you know which Uh, yep. so i just want uh, to know, ask you about it let me just take a step back into a novel that i wrote called keepers of the kal chakra yeah. uh, yeah. and that novel was born out of a nightmare that was born out of a out of the fact that i woke up at 3 in the morning soaked in sweat because the nightmare had felt so terrifyingly real uh, and i was unable to go back to sleep but i made a mental note of what the nightmare was and the next morning i i i asked my wife i said listen you know that at that moment when i was going through that dream that really felt real it felt mm-hmm. as if it was it mm-hmm. was my actual life mm-hmm. and that led me to a to a question that what if uh you know if consider this that uh imagine a physics laboratory in which you've got this apparatus set up and you've got two light bulbs on the left and the right on the extremes with a power source and in the middle you have what is called a flip switch so if you flip the switch towards the right the 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 right bulb lights up and the left one goes out and then if you flip it the other way around then uh, the left bulb goes on and the right one goes out um uh, and i was thinking to myself that what if my life is like that 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 at night i go to sleep but actually that is my real life for that moment mm. and this is actually the dream my mm-hmm. real life is the dream this is the dream and that is real uh so what if everyone is leading a double life mm. uh in that sense uh and uh to a very great extent for for me uh the the world that i dabble in in the world of fiction if you notice is very very grounded mm. uh in reality uh so it talks about current issues it talks about history it talks about stories that we've grown up with it even co- covers mundane issues like accounting and you know uh uh or politics or uh uh principles of economics so in that sense uh i am not one of those 
I'm not one of those fantasy creators like uh, J.K. Rowling who creates mm. this entire world of Hogwarts. Uh, for me, it's very much grounded in the in the in the real world. Uh, so in that sense, I never really stray away from mm. the world in which I'm living. Uh, my my fiction is very much derived uh, mm. from the real world, from what I'm seeing happening around me, uh, from in interesting incidents that have happened, from the newspaper headlines. Yeah. Uh, from hist historical texts and what what have you. In that sense, my fiction, when I do research also in, in order to write my fiction, I'm ending mm -hmm. up actually exploring the real world far deeper than I ordinarily mm -hmm. would. Okay. So I don't really need to make that transition, Anuja. Uh, and the other part of it also is that to a very great extent, I think I grew up in a world of business uh, so, I mean, from age 12 onwards, I started assisting my father in running a family business. And, uh, uh, you know, when I was writing The, the Vault of Vishnu, there was a very mm -hmm. interesting uh, uh, little uh, uh, bit that I picked up about because I was writing about the journey of Wanzang uh, and uh, one of the spots where he spent a substantial time was now what we call the city of Samarkand. Mm -hmm. And the city of Samarkand had this very interesting uh, anecdote about the children who were born in Samarkand. Mm -hmm. And uh, any child born, any male child born into the family of a merchant or a trader, they would uh, touch a drop of honey to the tongue of the child. And they mm -hmm. would touch a drop of glue to the palm of the child. And mm -hmm. the, the concept was that uh, when this child grows up, then he'll have a tongue which is as sweet as honey in order to be able to sell anything. Uh, and he would have a sticky palm so that gold coins would stick to the palm and he would become very, very rich. And so Lovely. in that context, uh, my life for probably uh, from age 12 till probably age around 40 was uh, pretty much determined like the child of Samarkand where, you know, I mean, uh, the, the cultural context was that uh, you know, bookkeeping was more important than book reading. And uh, reading a balance sheet was more important than reading a book. So uh, in that sense, the real world around me is never far away from me. No matter that, I mean, I 10 years ago when people used to ask me, what are you? I would say, I'm a businessman who's trying to be a writer. Now I'm a writer who's trying to be a businessman. Uh, so, I mean, in the sense that both of those worlds coexist side by side. They are like the dream state and the real state. Unfortunately, I often do not know which is which. Okay, uh, there's this question from one of our viewers. Um, uh, where does human pain and injustice come in the zone of ancient Indian wisdom. And sorry, so, sorry, Anuja, your voice would also like your uh, sorry, Anuja, you, icon, you, you you've been uh, tantric your, philosophy. So, so I completely lost you, Anuja. I didn't pick up on the question at all. The data connection is very bad at your end. Hey, can you? Yeah. Okay. I, I've just seen it on the yeah. Now, can you hear me now? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I can also see the question which has come in on the chat box. Where does human pain and injustice come in the zone of ancient Indian wisdom? And I mean, we see this repeated again and again. No, I mean, so you can't... It... sorry. Sorry, Anucha. Yeah, I... go ahead. Go ahead. Ashwin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question was, where does human pain and injustice come in the zone of ancient Indian wisdom? And we see this again and again, right? I mean, what were the Pandavas asking for? For five villages. Krishna asked for five villages. Uh, I mean, now you, you wonder as to what caused the entire Mahabharata. Uh, or for example, I mean, the, the entire 14-year exile uh, that is described in the Ramayana. Uh, and frankly, I mean, if you really think about it, most of the greatest stories of the world are, uh, have their genesis in an injustice. Uh, as I like to joke very often, without without Ravan and Shurpankha, you would not have a Ramayana. Uh, 
so in 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 that sense uh it's it's the very embryo it's the very genesis uh, of our stories and of course we love uh those stories where those injustices are set right uh, so for example i mean uh, you know you look at the story of for example kautilya uh you know saying that i will not tie my shikha till the time that i have purged uh the 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 state of magad uh, from dhananand and his evil uh progeny uh now that's 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 wow you know it's almost a hindi film uh, sort of revenge story and you love the fact that he succeeds in installing chandragupta maurya to the throne but at the end of the day the life does not play out that way i mean at the end of the day eventually kautilya what does he i mean you, depending upon the version that you decide uh he either becomes uh, uh at daggers drawn to bindusara or otherwise alternatively he becomes a jain monk and he takes samadhi a uh, uh, dying an old and uh, unwanted man uh, on the other hand uh, i mean if you uh, even go back into the 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 mahabharat story where does it end well for even the so called victors uh, i mean uh, to land up at to land up in heaven and to find that the kauravs have been made able to make it to heaven and they are not worthy of uh, worthy of being accommodated in heaven that in itself is again uh, something which is a uh, dramatic so i think great stories uh no matter what the age i think they try and explain to you the the reality of life they try and explain what is it that drives us those human uh, human emotions like for example the desire for revenge but they also uh, a good story i've always maintained is not only a great story is not only one that entertains you but also along the way it slightly educates you and maybe by the time you finish reading it it enlightens you so i call it the three e's educate uh, entertain educate and enlighten so in in that sense i think these these great stories not only make you want to read because of the fact that they are very engaging but along the way they maybe also educate you in terms of what you should be looking out for because the wise man is not only the one who learns from his own mistakes but he also learns from the mistakes of others uh and finally of course along the way you realize what is it all worth um uh, i had a deep uh, during this uh, during this uh, covid pandemic uh, anuja i was uh, during uh, new year's eve i was sitting uh, in jaipur and i had a little moment to myself and i wrote down on a piece of paper the five things that drive my happiness and i keep those in my wallet those five points just as a reminder to myself and you know it was so surprising when i looked at those points again i said people would think that it would be about power wealth fame you know uh, when i was studying at yale university and i was doing my mba there in those days uh, the mba used to be known as the mppm uh, and we used to joke that it meant more power prestige and money uh and uh, uh along the way uh when i looked at those five drivers of my happiness i realized that you know one of the things that i want is my my own health and the good health of people around me uh the second thing i want is wealth but only up to that point where i don't have to look to someone else to be able to support me i want to be able to indulge in the small pleasures of life like taking a holiday or being able to go out for a meal i'm not looking for private jets or yachts uh enjoy but, your whiskey without feeling judged exactly so when i mean health and wealth came right at the top of that list as the first two then i realized that actually what makes my life valuable is in terms of the relationships that i have whether it's my family relationships or my friendships because they make me feel worthwhile i realized that the fourth item that was there on my list was the creative pursuit the just the joy of being able to pursue something and see it through and finally i realized that the fifth thing that drives me is a belief in a greater power i don't want to call it god i don't want to call it by any name but it's the belief that there is a greater power and that makes me feel more comfortable in my own skin and when i look at these five points i realize that hey listen what are we running after the things that make us actually happy are so simple so i think that's what great storytelling is about to bring about that in, to to not only entertain you but also make you familiar with that age old wisdom 
Wow, Ashwin's on fire today. And wait, there's this other question for you. Uh, what's your take on tantric philosophy? Well, at the end of the day, what, you know, I mean, what is ultimately tantra attempting to, I mean, this is something which I've covered in much greater detail in Keepers of the Kal Chakra. But the way I like to think about tantra is really uh, in the context of a peacock, right? Uh -huh. uh, we, we, we look at everything in terms of uh, in terms of good and bad, uh, negative and positive. But I'm one of those who has always believed that these are not opposites, but they are the absence of. So for example, darkness is the absence of light. Uh, it's mm. not the opposite of light. Uh, or cold is the absence of heat. It's not the opposite of light. Uh, and in that sense, I'm also one of those who has always believed that Shiva is the absence of Shakti. Uh, so uh, uh, in that sense, if you are talking about energy, then there is only female energy. And where there is a lack of that female energy, where there is a lack of Shakti, you will find that so-called masculinity as it were. Uh, so in that sense, if you really think about it, there is no, uh, there is nothing like positive, negative, the question is what you do with those energies. Mm. Uh, so the reason why I bring up the peacock as an example is because the peacock is uh, one of those few birds which can actually consume poison by mm. fighting uh, the mongoose and the snake. Okay. Uh, and it can actually consume poison. Uh, and for most people, poison would either make you very sick or it would make you uh, die. Mm. But instead, what does the peacock do? The peacock uh, processes that poison in order to give colors to its plumage. The, the reason you see that those vibrant colors on the peacock is because of the poison that has been processed. So that is what essentially Tantra is all about, which is being able to take alternate forms of energy and to make them still very, very powerful and very beneficial and so people think of tantric philosophy in a negative light. Yes, I'm sure that there must be many, many elements of tantric philosophy over the years, which are, are used for a negative purpose also, but they can also be used in a very, very positive and benevolent way. Lovely. And uh, last question for Ashwin, though we are highly reluctant to let you go. Uh, is vault of Vishnu connected to the treasure found in Trivandrum Padmanabhan temple? But actually, if you read the book, you'll realize that uh, it's more about uh, the Pallavas in Kanchi Absolutely. and uh, Cambodia. But by so the way, that question, the, the question does come up because of the fact that we associate Padmanabha Swami temple with the vaults which went through this entire period of, uh, is it going to be opened? Is it not going to be opened? What is the curse associated with a particular vault? Uh, will the government be taking it over or will it remain with the temple trustees? So it's ve very much uh, top of imagination for a lot of people. And they associate the vault with the Travancore dynasty and Padmanabha Swami. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the vault of Vishnu refers to a very different vault. For anyone who reads the book, yeah, it is yeah. related to a, to a vault which uh, relates to... Uh, a treasure house of knowledge, uh, which uh, I found very, very fascinating that uh, today in India, you ask a person, you know, do you know of Bodhi Dharma? And they will think that they are, that you are talking about the Buddhist faith, Bodhi Dharma. They will not realize that you're talking about a historical figure who existed Pallava. during Pallava times, a Pallava prince who traveled through Cambodia went to China uh, and then eventually appeared uh, at, the, uh, at the footsteps of the Shaolin Monastery where he asked to be given admittance. And the uh, chief monk, the abbot of the monastery was reluctant because apparently this was a very wild sort of character with long, loose, flowing hair and very wild and eccentric gestures. Uh, and so he did not admit him. And Bodhidharma, rather than giving up uh, sat inside a cave for the next nine years uh, uh, 
in very, very deep meditation. Uh, and in, of course, in Japanese philosophy, Bodhidharma is known as Daruma. Uh, and uh, you have these, these uh, Daruma dolls in Japan, which have a round bottom so that you can punch them and they still bounce back because that is the nature of perseverance that uh, wow. Bodhidharma showed. And uh, because he was sitting in meditation for such long periods of time, uh, he had no alternative but to create a physical routine, uh, which was uh, yogic uh, breathing combined with two ancient martial arts from the south of India, uh, Kalari Payatu Kalari and Payatu. Silambam. And he mixed all of these ups uh, into a physical routine to keep his blood circulation and muscle strength intact. And eventually, when he was admitted nine years later, he taught the other monks, and that became what we now call Kung Fu. So uh, the vault of Vishnu refers to that ancient wisdom uh, more than uh, simply the wealth stored in the coffers of Padmanabha Swami. Right then. Thanks so much, Ashwin. I could seriously keep talking to you forever. And I'm just sorry that we aren't actually in Mysuru where we could have, you know, continued this over a cup of coffee. So I Absolutely. hope our paths cross sooner than later. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much for this. Thank, thank you, Anuja. You, as usual, it's always with you. It's never an effort to uh, do a discussion. It is always free flowing and just feels like an, a casual coffee time, tea time conversation. So thank you. So Ashwin, entertain, educate, enlighten. So a new three E's for us to follow. Ashwin, you're so pragmatic and intense in your expression. You know, we, could, we can feel that in your writing and we could see that while you were expressing throughout your talk. It's been such a wonderful, either the talk. We really enjoyed it. Pushpaka Vimana surgery. Dharma at the same time, Shunyata, connecting Bharatka civilization and digging into it beautifully, mixing up philosophy and science into the story is so sensational. That's what makes Ashwin Sanghi a different person. Thank you know, you. that's what attracts the whole India towards your writing. Anuta, beauty and brain. You proved it again. You know? Thank you. Right questions to bring out the best in Ashwin. Thank you so much. And Ashwin and Anuja, we would love to have you both in Mysore sometime. Absolutely. Let's hope and pray that, you know, the pandemic ends and we can actually meet in person. I look forward and, to that. Thank yeah. you so much, Shubha, for inviting me. Thank you, Mysuru Literature Festival. And yeah. thanks, uh, sweet and dear Anuja, for doing, host, uh, you know, doing the moderation of this session. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.